In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. And you may be seated for the choir anthem, Seek Ye First. Thank you very much, choir. Appreciate that. So the baptism party will please come forward for the sacrament of holy baptism. This is Silas and Kevin and, excuse me, Kevin and Samantha. And then we got Jason and Rebecca as sponsors. Glad to have you all here. <clears throat> the order of baptism is printed in your service folder, so if you'd follow along beginning on bottom page two, we'd appreciate that. All of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. 
We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. The word of God teaches that we are all conceived and born sinful and are under the power of the devil until Christ claims us as his own. We would be lost forever unless delivered from sin, death, and everlasting condemnation. But the Father of all mercy and grace has sent his Son, Jesus Christ, who atoned for the sin of the whole world, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Silas John Welter received the sign of the Holy Cross, both upon your forehead and upon your heart, to mark you as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. From ancient times, the church has observed the custom of appointing sponsors for baptismal candidates. It is the task of sponsors to confess the Christian faith expressed in the Apostles' Creed. They're to pray for them, support them, and their ongoing instruction and nurture in the Christian faith, and encourage them toward the faithful reception of the Lord's Supper. Sponsors are at all times to be examples of the holy life of faith in Christ and love for one's neighbor. So Jason and Rebecca, is it your intention to serve Silas as sponsors in the Christian faith? Yes, with, with the, the help, help of God. God enable you both to will and to do this faithful and loving work, and by his grace fulfill what we are unable to do. In order to implore the blessing of our Lord Jesus upon the gathering of Silas into the family of God, let us all join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And Silas, the Lord preserve your coming in and your going out from this time forth and even forevermore. Amen. Because Silas cannot answer for himself, we shall all together with his parents and his sponsors faithfully speak on his behalf in the testimony of the forgiveness of sins and the birth of the life of faith which God our Father gives in and through baptism. Do you renounce the devil in all his works and all his ways? I do. Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son? Yes, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into heaven. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Okay, Rebecca, would you place this head over the water, please? Silas John Welter, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given you the new birth by water and the Spirit, and has forgiven you all your sins, strengthen you with his grace to life everlasting. Peace be with you. Amen. He's a happy baby. <laughs> and he should be. Specifically today. The light of Christ. We light it from the Christ candle. It reminds us that Jesus has taken us out of the darkness of sin and brought us into the light of life. And that's what happened here. Silas was united with Jesus in Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection so that he can have life, life forever. So we pray for the two of you as well as you raise Silas, that he continue to grow in that knowledge and that wonderful love. And we have that as a reminder. But then we also have a way to help you is through this faith chest that we have, as you well know uh, how this works. It's part of our milestones program here at St. John's, so you get this chest. Uh, and part of our milestone program is that periodically we have specific um, programs for parents of young kids and as kids grow up, for parents and kids, all about how to connect with Christ 
uh, and do kinds of things together, uh, sharing his word and growing in God's love. So that's what this chest is for, because usually there's a gift that goes along with that. So as we can accumulate these kinds of things, already you can put in the napkin that from the baptism. You can put the baptism candle. Here's the certificate. Uh, we also have a packet of material uh, from our cradle roll, uh, and inside of this is a whole bunch of stuff that already uh, you can be doing for Silas. Prayers for, for him, songs that you can sing to him, and things like that. So some good stuff in here. And then just as kind of a a nice gift here, um, Our Lady's Aid, uh, very specifically made a little quilt here, a little blanket for, uh, for Silas. And of course, it had to have John Deere on it. <laughs> this, this wasn't a big surprise when I saw this one, to be perfectly honest. Uh, they tried to make them personal, and that's going to work. You're, you're, you're locked in, you, no matter what, you, you are locked in. So uh, anyway, uh, this is to be used. Don't keep it in, the, in there, use it, okay? That's what it's for, and uh, hopefully you'll get many years of enjoyment out of that as well. Okay, uh, thank you, Mark. Yep. I'll just lay that right there. Okay, and now we'll uh, conclude our baptism service with a prayer. Um, again, it's on page four of your service folder. Almighty and most merciful God and Father, we thank and praise you that you graciously preserve and enlarge your family and have granted Silas the new birth and holy baptism and made him a member of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and heir of your heavenly kingdom. We humbly implore you that as he has now become your child, you would keep him in his baptismal grace, that according to your good pleasure, he may faithfully grow to lead a godly life to the praise and honor of your holy name. And finally, with all your saints, obtain the promised inheritance in heaven. Look also with kindness upon Kevin and Samantha, and upon all parents. Let them ever rejoice in the gift that you have given them. Enable them to be good teachers and examples of righteousness to Silas. Strengthen them in their own baptism, so that they may share eternally with their children the salvation you have given them through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And Silas, we welcome you in Jesus' name as a brother in Christ, that together we may hear his word, receive his gifts, and proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We welcome you And you, Silas, the Lord bless you in all your ways from this time forth and even forevermore. Amen. Let's give Silas a hand of welcome. You can blow that out. <clears throat> and you can return to your seats. Although he's a very happy baby, I think Silas was saying, okay, we've had enough. <laughs> <laughs> now it's time for a little different position, so uh, very nice. Thank you, Kevin and Samantha, for allowing us to participate in this. And now we continue with our scripture readings for today. Old Testament reading from Isaiah chapter 38. In those days, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to him and said, this is what the Lord says, put your house in order because you're going to die you will not recover. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord, Remember, O Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, Go and tell Hezekiah, This is what the Lord, the God of your father David, says, I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will add 15 years to your life. And I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city. This is the Lord's sign to you that the Lord will do what he has promised. I will make the shadow cast by the sun go back the ten steps. It has gone down on the stairway of Ahaz. So the sunlight went back the ten steps it had gone down. A writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, after his illness and recovery, I said, in the prime of my life must I go through the gates of death and be robbed of the rest of my years? The Lord will save me. And we will sing with stringed instruments all the days of our lives in the temple of the Lord. Isaiah had said, prepare a poultice of figs and apply it to the boil and he will recover. This is the word of our Lord. The epistle reading for today from Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 28 happens like this. Uh, the apostle Paul had been arrested uh, in Israel, and he appealed his case to the emperor of Rome, 
which of course is in Rome. So he was on a boat uh, under arrest being taken from Israel to Rome. While they were on the ship, a huge storm came up. So much so that eventually, as they came close to the island of Malta, on the rocks off of the shore, the ship was wrecked. It was just crashed right into it and destroyed. Paul and everyone else on the ship made it safely to the shore of Malta. And this event, or the reading that we have, happens just as they are coming on shore. Once safely on shore, we found out that the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood, and as he put it on the fire, a viper, driven out by the heat, fastened itself on his hand. When the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, this man must be a murderer, for though he escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. But Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. The people expected him to swell up or suddenly fall dead. But after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. There was an estate nearby that belonged to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us to his home and for three days entertained us hospitably. His father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went in to see him and, after prayer, placed his hands on him and healed him. When this had happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. They honored us in many ways, and when we were ready to sail, they furnished us with the supplies we needed. This is the word of our Lord. And then the Holy Gospel from Luke chapter 4. Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over and rebuked the fever, and it left her. She got up at once and began to wait on them. When the sun was setting, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sicknesses, and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people shouting, you are the son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Christ. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him and when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. This is the gospel of our Lord. And now we'll continue with the next hymn. It's printed on the screen.
And grace to you and peace from God our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So all of the three scripture readings today had to deal with healing. There was miraculous healing in each one of the readings. In the Old Testament reading, it was the king, Hezekiah. He got very sick and was about to die. In fact, the prophet Isaiah went to him and told him, you're going to die, make preparations. But then Hezekiah prayed, and God in his mercy healed him and very specifically extended his life 15 years. In the epistle reading for today from Acts, there were a number of healings. One was Paul himself. When that poisonous snake latched onto his hand, Paul should have died. Everyone was expecting it. They had seen this happen many times. But Paul just shook it off and there were no ill effects at all. God protected him. And then there was Publius's father. Publius was like the governor and his father had been sick, uh, fever and dysentery, close to death. But Paul healed him. God healed him through Paul. And then it says other people on the island brought their sick to Paul and he healed every one of them too. And then the gospel reading for today, Simon Peter's mother-in-law was sick. She had a fever. She was probably laying on the bed unable to do anything. And then Jesus came. He touched her. And immediately she got up and was restored to complete health. But it wasn't just her either. That day, all kinds of people were brought to Jesus. And Jesus performed a miracle on every one of them who was sick and healed all of them. Now when we hear these kinds of accounts in the scripture... On the one hand, we rejoice and we're grateful and we're glad that that God is indeed one who cares about us individually. He hears our prayers and he indeed heals. Many of us have prayed when we were sick and we've been healed. You've had other family members and other friends who were sick. You prayed for them and they were healed. But for today, let's cut to the chase. Let's cut to the real difficult type stuff. For those times when healing doesn't happen when people don't get well, no matter how many prayers might be said. And it's not just people in general, but sometimes it's you. You yourself have some kind of illness, some kind of disease, something that hurts, that's painful, that just zaps you of all your energy. And worst of all, Even when it doesn't happen, even if it doesn't happen to you, worst of all is when it happens to someone that you love. And you see them there suffering. You see them lying in the bed. You see how weak they are. And then you say, God, what's going on? I prayed and I'm not seeing any healing. Worst of all is when it happens to a child. And a child is sick and hurting and nothing seems to work to make it better so then the question becomes and I said let's just cut to the chase today and the question becomes the question that people ask in times like that okay where's God why isn't he healing he did it in the Bible all over the place why isn't he answering my prayer doesn't he care Is he so far away, he's got too many other things to do that I don't matter to him? Or maybe he just doesn't like me anymore. Or sometimes people even go on and say then, well, all that stuff in the Bible, healing this person and healing that person, all a fairy tale. All just a great big fable, because it's not happening. Sometimes people get angry at God. Very angry. Because it hurts. It's sad. It's difficult to watch someone have to suffer from something and then seemingly not get better. So how do we answer all that? What does the scripture tell us about that? Sometimes Jesus heals. There's no doubt about it. I've already said that. And a number of times you've been healed from sicknesses. But then what about those times when healing doesn't happen? Well, there's a couple of things that we want to talk about today. One is absolutely 100% true. 
but ultimately it doesn't provide a whole lot of comfort. And the truth is this, that God does work in his own way, in his own time, according to what he knows is best. Sometimes that involves immediate healing. Sometimes it doesn't. We trust that God knows what he's doing. We trust in the gracious God who cares about us. But it still raises questions and sometimes even doubts. But here's the thing that we do need to keep in mind more than anything else. We need to understand this whole thing about illnesses and sicknesses and God's role in it. And when we have the bigger picture, then we can understand some things and find comfort and hope, even if healing doesn't happen. First of all, one of the things we got to remember is that ultimately, ultimately, diseases, illnesses, disabilities, various chronic conditions aren't really so much the result of germs, viruses, infections, accidents. They're a result of sin. They're a result of sin. If there was no sin in this world, as it was when God first created, there would be no sickness, period. No matter what there was germs were doing, no matter what viruses were flying around, there would be no sickness. God did not create a world with sickness. It came into the world because of sin. There's a direct connection between sin and sickness. Now, don't get me wrong, and don't go this route. It does not mean that when a person comes down with some kind of disease, they obviously committed some time a really terrible sin, and now they're suffering the consequences. It does not work like that. No, 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 no. Don't ever, ever think that. Don't look at someone who's lying on a, on a bed, very sick, and try to think, okay, what sin did you do to cause this to happen to you? It doesn't work that way at all. The way it works is this. That all of creation was cursed at the time of Adam and Eve's fall into sin. And they brought sin into this world that resulted in death. Wages of sin is death. But prior to death, there's the continuing (sighs) dissolution of the human body. It may get very strong at a particular point in life, but over the years, no matter what, it starts to decay and break down and doesn't work so well. Sometimes there are very specific episodes of illness. Other times it's just a matter of kind of getting older and fading away. No matter what, death is going to happen. And it's because of sin. It's because of sin. Now this then is where Jesus is going to come in. Jesus is going to deal with the root cause of sickness, illness, disability, death. He's going to deal with the root cause of it. Not just with the symptoms. Okay? You'll understand. You know what that means. You know very well. You know very well that symptoms can many times be treated. You know, you have a cold. You have a cold and you got a stuffed up nose. You know what happens. You can go take a medicine and you'll be free of your stuffed up nose for about six hours, right? You still got the cold. You haven't dealt with the cold at all. You just dealt with the symptom. Even people who have have grave diseases, um, people are getting better at how to handle their symptoms. If they got bad pain, pain can usually be treated, usually can be handled. If people have other kinds of physical things, there's usually some kind of treatment that can be done. But it's just dealing with symptoms. It's not dealing with the root cause. Jesus came to deal with the root cause, not just with the symptom. 
The root cause is sin. Illness is a symptom. Yes, it's very true. He performed miracles that healed Hezekiah, that healed Publius' father, that healed Simon Peter's mother-in-law, and a whole bunch of other people that we didn't know. But it was just a symptom. What eventually happened to Hezekiah? He still died. What eventually happened to Publius' father? I haven't met him. What's happened to uh, Peter's mother-in-law? Right? The healing that Jesus did, which was indeed miraculous, and it showed that he was God because he had power to do this, was temporary. That's all that it was. Oh, they were grateful. And it was a wondrous thing. But it was temporary. That's how it always is. With us too. One illness gets healed. But it's temporary. You know you're going to come down with something else. And then that one can be healed. But it's temporary. You're going to come down with something else. And every one of us knows. We don't like to say it. Every one of us is going to die. And we can't stop that. No matter how wondrous medicine is. No matter how many times God answers prayer and says, yes, I will heal you. Still going to die. Because you got to deal with the root problem. Not with the symptom. And that's what Jesus came to do. He came to deal with the root problem. If all Jesus needed to do to make people happy was to be a healer, God wouldn't have sent him as a savior. Would have sent him as a doctor. Now open, come and heal. But that's treating symptoms. He had to deal with sin. And so Jesus came to deal with sin. Very specifically, taking it all upon him. And suffering the most horrific consequence of sin... Death, heaped with the guilt of the sin of the world and the wrath of God pouring down upon him, he suffered it in his body. But then you know very well he rose again on that third day. He triumphed over all of it. He had conquered that root problem of sin and he took it away. He conquered the grave. Even death was gone. Of course death was gone. If indeed sin is gone, death is gone too. If death is gone, it means that illnesses have no power anymore either. So then you say, well, what's the deal here? How come we still get sick? How come we still die? As long as we are in this flesh on this world, the scripture tells us, we will indeed be subject to the consequences of sin in this world. We will get sick and we will die. But the scripture is real clear. Understand that when your life began at the moment of the conception in your mother's womb, that was just the beginning of an eternity to come. The life we live here in this world is so very, very, very short compared to the eternity of time that God has already given to us as a gift. And look what happens then. We live in this world. Many times we're healthy. Many times things are going incredibly well. Many times when that's happening, we forget to thank God for our health, but we go on. Sometimes we get sick. Many times we get healed. No matter what, we die. But tell me this. When King Hezekiah, after he had been healed, then finally died, was it all over for him? Uh Uh-uh. When he died, his soul left his body. To do what? To go and to be with Jesus forever. Life. His body was buried in the ground. It's still in the ground. 
It's long since decayed to dust. But every single particle of that body, Jesus knows. And Jesus has promised that on that last day, he's going to come back. He's even going to raise that very same body. Now, this body is going to be glorified. This is a body that's never going to get sick again. Because sin is gone. If sin is gone, there can be no sickness. And if there's no sickness and no sin, there's not going to be any more death. And here now is really God's answer to sickness, to death. It's a life, a glorified life in the body to be lived with him in the paradise of heaven forever and ever. You see, we need to keep this in perspective. And I know that's hard to do when you're in a hospital bed, when you can't get out of a chair, when it aches every single time you move, it can be very hard to think of the broader perspective. But that's why we talk about it now. To get it into our souls, to take this this truth of the love of Jesus Christ and the victory that he has won for us so that we can see things by faith that may not be visible to the physical world, but we know to be true. We have life. And this disease is going to be conquered. And even my death has already been swallowed up in victory. And we got a couple of hints about all this. In the scripture readings for today, when Jesus Jesus was uh, healing... He healed his mother-in-law and then he healed a whole bunch of other people. The very next morning, he went out very early to pray and then the crowd found him. The crowd found him and they wanted him to come back and do some more healing because boy, they found more sick people. But what did Jesus say to them? He said, no. I have to go to other places and I have to proclaim the gospel. Because this is why I was sent to this world. It's not about healing symptoms. You saw that, you know I'm God because of that. The gospel is God's good news that he has conquered our enemies, our mortal enemies, and has given life. And Jesus was going to proclaim that so people would hear it, take it to their hearts, and know the bigger picture That was what was most important. With Hezekiah, interesting thing. Hezekiah, in that reading for today, was called the son of David. David was his father. That is significant. God had made a promise to King David that from his line would come the Christ. Okay? Now, you had David, you had Solomon, you had a bunch of other kings, and then you had Hezekiah. Hezekiah is in the line. Now Hezekiah got sick. Hezekiah got sick. He was going to die. But he really couldn't die. Why not? He didn't have a son yet. He had no heir to carry on the line. If indeed the line of God was going to continue, if God's promise was going to be fulfilled, Hezekiah needed to have a son. There wasn't one yet. It was no surprise that God said, no, you're not going to die. He couldn't. God's plan has to be fulfilled. Three years after his sickness, Hezekiah had a son. A son by the name of Manasseh. He's the next one in line. You see, even in the scripture, it points to Jesus as being the Christ, the one who comes to deal with the root problem. And it's because he's done that, then, that we can have confidence when we get sick, when our loved ones are sick. We have the certainty that Jesus is hearing our prayer And we know that he's dealt with the root cause already and that all who believe in him have life eternal and that nothing in this world is ever going to take that away, not any kind of sickness, no matter how bad it might be, and certainly not the grave. It's already been overcome. 
And so we pray with confidence. We live in confidence. We live with this picture beautifully shared with us called the gospel of Jesus Christ that's all about life. Life in its wholeness with Jesus forever and ever. So that's the answer. Does God care? Is he listening when seemingly a person isn't getting better? Oh boy, does he care. He gave his life. He gave his life so that this will not be the end. And he simply calls us to trust him. To trust. To trust and to believe and to know that in his arms we truly are whole, body, mind, and soul. Amen. And the peace of God is past all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Unto life everlasting. Amen. We have a couple of new prayers that we're going to say today. Uh, one is for Walt Podine. Uh, many of you know him, member of our congregation. Uh, during the last uh, weeks, he's gotten progressively weaker. Uh, I don't think he's been eating properly and drink, not drinking properly. So he was hospitalized for a few days this past week uh, to get him caught back up. And now he's going to be at the Spring Valley Care Center uh, for a few weeks, most likely, as they help him to regain his strength. And hopefully um, he'll be able to return home sometime after that. Then we also want to say a prayer for Nora Walker. Nora Walker is the great-granddaughter of Cliff and Arlene Walker. Uh, she is just a young girl. I'm not exactly sure how old she is, but she's been suffering with epileptic seizures and heart problems, and her parents are missionaries in Sweden. So that's where they are right at the moment, and uh, the prayer request was indeed that the doctors will be able to help her the best and, of course, to heal Nora. And then uh, this past week, we were calling the pastors on our call list, the one that came from our district president, uh, to see if the pastors were indeed available uh, to consider a call. And one of the pastors was a man by the name of Matthew Kennedy uh, from Spencerport, New York, Trinity Lutheran Church. He said he was not going to be available to consider a call at this time because his four-year-old son, Lincoln, uh, was just diagnosed with muscular dystrophy, uh, a very significant uh, diagnosis, and right at the moment they're going through all of the things that need to be done in order to care for Lincoln. Uh, so while he said, I cannot ex uh, think about a call at this time, he did say, would you please pray for us? Would you pray for us and my, specifically for my son Lincoln? And we want to do that then this morning as well. Uh, prayer of Thanksgiving is going to go for the birth of a baby girl to Jeff and Brittany Smith. Uh, that'll be Paul and Sue Smith's granddaughter. Uh, Zoe Lorraine was born yesterday afternoon, weighed 7 pounds, five, 15 ounces, and everyone is doing very, very well. Would you please stand for a word of prayer? Dearest Jesus, we thank you for having come into this world to be our Savior. You didn't come to be our doctor, you came to be our Savior. You dealt with the root cause of all the problems in this world, including those of illness. You dealt with sin. You took it upon ourselves in order to defeat it. You proved it by rising from the dead. Today, there is nothing that will ever separate us from you, including any illnesses or diseases. We truly pray that you will bless all people who are ill. We pray that by your grace, you will heal them. We pray that you will comfort their families, that they can find strength at difficult times. But we also do pray that your will be done. For you do know what is best. And by faith, we trust you. We trust you to do what is best, as indeed you demonstrated by your victory for us. And so today we pray for Walt Podine, uh, asking you to continue to heal him, uh, make him strong again, so he'll be able to return home soon. We pray for Nora Walker. We pray that the seizures will stop. We pray that the heart condition will be healed. To that end, give wisdom and guidance to the medical teams that attend to her. May they truly be your instruments of healing to her body. We also pray for Pastor Kennedy and his wife Bethany and their four-year-old son Lincoln, as he's been diagnosed with muscular dystrophy. We truly pray that you will indeed bless those who attend to him, entire medical teams, therapy teams, and so on, that they indeed can do wonders to bring healing to little Lincoln's body. 
We pray that you give strength also to Pastor Kennedy and his wife. May they truly find in you the, the respite that they need from the challenges of the day. May they find in you their strength, knowing that you, dear Jesus, love them and embrace them for all eternity. Continue to be with all the other people. We pray for Maxine Runkle, those in the care center, Glenn Fine and Mike Fine, Lyndon Luke, and Daley Norgrant. Be also with Gertrude Holzerland and Walter Bannett as they are receiving hospice care. And finally, dear God, we ask for your blessings to rest upon Zoe Lorraine Smith as she was born yesterday to Jeff and Brittany. We thank you for this great gift. We pray that you embrace her with your love, bring her soon to holy baptism, and indeed bless Jeff and Brittany to raise Zoe, knowing your love today and forever. We pray all this, dear Jesus, in your name. Amen. You may be seated. The offering is going to be received. During the offering, if you're not yet signed the friendship registers, please do that. Uh, we're celebrating Holy Communion today as well, so check your communion attendance too. Thank you. And please stand for the preface to Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. Lord. Lift up your hearts. Lift Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. He alone took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Only by his wounds are we healed. Today, Jesus is present in this holy sacrament, giving us his body and blood for our blessing. Grant that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And you may be seated for the distribution. And please stand for the dismissal. Now may this body which is given for you and this blood which is shed for you strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. And let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank and praise you that you have again refreshed us with the gift of your holy body and blood in this comforting sacrament. Keep us in faith that we may continually rejoice in the wholeness of heart, body, and mind that you so graciously grant to those you love. In your name we pray, amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Oh.